dividends and capital gains. I'll be honest with you, I love both of them because both of them can make me a lot richer. But when it comes to achieving financial independence, one thing you might be wondering is, should you be you know, gearing your investments more towards gaining dividends or should you be like gearing your investments more towards capital gains? So that's why in this video, we are gonna determine you know, what's gonna be better for achieving financial independence. Focusing on dividends or focusing on capital gains and make sure that you stay to the end because there's a super important like ultra important concept uh, regarding these two things that you need to know. But before we begin, I just want to say really quick, uh, a little bit of a disclaimer here is that uh, most of what I'm going to be saying is a lot of opinion uh, and it's going to be a lot of bias. I do have a bias towards one end of these investments. Okay. And for pretty good reason, I believe, of course, uh, everyone always believes that their bias is a uh, you know, good mannered, but just definitely keep that in mind that this is a lot of opinion and a lot of bias when it comes to these two investing strategies. Okay. And both of them can work, uh, you know, tremendously. A lot of people have had success with both of them. A lot of people have had, you know, detrimental effects using both of these strategies. And so no uh, investing strategy is 100% perfect and without faults. Now let's first all get on the same page here really quickly uh, and define what dividends and capital gains are. So dividends, those are pretty easy. Dividends are a distribution uh, from a company, uh, from its earnings, or sometimes from its, uh, you know, earnings that it's kept, like in savings accounts, whatever, uh, to its shareholders. So basically, the company is sending out some money to its shareholders, and that is basically what a dividend is, you know, in really layman's terms here. Uh, a capital gain, on the other hand, is a realized increase in the value of something that you bought. Uh, usually, when we're talking about a stock is if a stock goes up in value uh, from what you bought it for and you realize that gain that is a capital gain so a lot of the times we have unrealized capital gains basically where uh, the value of the shares of something that we bought are worth more than what we bought it for but we haven't sold them yet and so those are unrealized uh, but those are both basically what they are uh, dividends versus capital gains the company is paying you money directly or you're selling off your ownership in the company when it comes to stocks at least uh, and you're realizing the increase in value of that share. And when we're comparing dividends and capital gains, it's important to kind of put some uh, something very similar together on how we can compare them. And for the criteria of comparing them, what I'm going to use is I'm going to use the S&P 500 because that's kind of like the default index fund investor, you know, investing in the S&P 500. And usually the default index fund investor is looking for, you know, long-term capital gains. And so that's what I'm going to use for the capital gains side. I'm going to use the S&P 500 fund. And uh, for the dividends, I'm going to use a dividend growth fund because that's a lot what a lot of people who are invest in dividends, a lot of them are looking for dividend growth because they want, you know, consistent dividends that are paid out on a consistent basis and they want the growth of those dividends, you know, to keep growing, right? So, so they can keep getting paid more over time and they can uh, do whatever they want with that income. Okay, so that's what I'm going to use kind of side by side, S&P 500 versus a dividend growth fund. And for that, uh, I'm going to be using Vanguard funds because Vanguard uh, is very popular, especially among uh, the financial independence community. And so for the S&P 500, I have uh, the fund VFIAX. Okay, that's going to represent the S&P 500. And for the dividend growth fund, I have one known as VDIGX. Okay, and that is literally called the Vanguard like dividend growth fund. So uh, that's what we're going to be comparing uh, side by side here rather than like looking at an individual stock, an individual company or something like that. So I think it's more fair to uh, compare on a, you know, on a mutual fund basis. Since we're kind of in essence, when we're comparing these two, we're kind of uh, comparing index fund investing versus, you know, dividend growth investing. Okay, so my personal approach, uh, here's where the bias comes in. Uh, my personal approach is to make things as simple as possible uh, and to invest in the index. And so a lot of my money is put into a fund similar to the S&P 500, like a total US stock market fund, which is like 80% S&P 500. And so just keep that in mind when we're talking about this. A lot of my personal uh, wealth is investing towards the uh, S&P 500 or towards the index fund uh, portion of this argument. Now, uh, let's first uh, start by comparing these two funds side by side. So the Vanguard S&P 500 fund and the Vanguard uh, Dividend Growth Fund. So uh, the one of the most important things, especially in my mind for long-term, you know, consistent, easy investing is to compare the fees. So the, uh, that is where uh, the S&P 500 is very, very uh, strong and very superior to many other uh, mutual funds is because the fees are extremely low. So in this case, the S&P 500 has a uh, fee on the Vanguard side of 0.04%, whereas the dividend growth uh, fund has a fee of 0.27%, okay? And that is, um, might not sound significant, you know, to someone who doesn't know, really know about uh, fees and mutual funds, but if you look at it this way as a percentage-wise, 
the dividend growth fund has a 575% uh, is more expensive in fees. You pay 575% more in fees because uh, when you go from 0.04% to 0.27%, that is 575% larger. Next, uh, we can compare the number of stocks uh, within those funds. So it's pretty, it should sound pretty obvious. The S&P 500 should have 500, right? Well, it does have 500 uh, companies, it's supposed to have 500 companies, but it actually has 509 different stocks because some companies are split up into two different uh, ticker symbols. So uh, 509 companies for the S&P 500 fund, uh, whereas the dividend growth fund only has 41 companies, okay? Because that, uh, that dividend growth uh, fund is supposed to be specializing in companies, usually that are already within the S&P 500 that consistently pay high dividends and and consistently have you know dividend growth and so in that case that fund only has 41 so that is a difference of 468 different companies so you know on the surface uh, level here it looks like it would appear that the SP 500 has more diversification because it has a lot more companies uh, than the dividend growth fund Next, uh, what we can look at here is the risk. Okay, and there's many different ways that you can calculate investment risk, uh, but one you know kind of like standard way to do it is uh, known as beta. Okay, so beta is pretty much what it's supposed to be is the uh, difference uh, of that fund compared to the overall market. And in this case, the S&P 500 is considered the market, and so the S&P 500 has a beta of one. That is supposed to be the baseline volatility. The dividend growth fund, on the other hand, has a beta of 0.95. So very, very close uh, because those companies are probably in the S&P 500 and they're already um, move a lot with the overall general market already, uh, but they are a little bit less volatile uh, than the overall market because dividend uh, paying companies, uh, they tend to be, uh, you know, very well established. They tend to be, uh, you know, kind of boring companies that you would say uh, that have just been consistently paying out for a long time. They have high profits and they pretty much always will for, you know, a really long time. And so that might be why uh, it has a little bit less uh, beta than the SP 500. And where you can actually see that in action is the sector breakdown of each uh, fund. So the SP 500 is heavily tilted uh, towards technology uh, because technology companies are the largest companies uh, pretty much in the world now. Uh, you know, they weren't not too long ago, but now they are. And so the S&P 500, 27.4% of it uh, is in technology stocks. Whereas in the dividend growth fund, uh, the largest sector within that one is industrials at 21.3%. So you can see that the industrial companies, uh, those are the ones that are going to you know, have profits they're going to pay out their profits because they're just so large and they've been so large for so long. And so that is uh, something that you can need to look at and need to pay attention. The S&P 500 is going to change as our economy changes, whereas the dividend growth is going to be, you know, it's also going to change, but it's going to remain mostly those companies that are consistently having long-term profits and consistently pay out most of those profits because there's not too much room for them to grow anymore. And maybe throughout that talk, when we were comparing those funds, you probably noticed um, a little bit of my bias that I mentioned earlier, uh, because I do, like I said, invest a lot into the SP 500 and index funds. Uh, and my bias is towards the lower fees, the more diversification, and the way that if the uh, economy changes, the SP 500 is going to change along with it because it's automatically going to just be based on whatever companies are large at that time. And then every other company is going to just fall off there. Whereas I believe the dividend growth, while there is definitely a strategy there, there is someone that has to be behind the lines, you know, selecting these companies that's not going to automatically just uh, change like the SP 500 index will. And now we get to the really good part is the actual effect on your taxes, okay? Because that's really important uh, when you're investing is you want to minimize taxes. So how are these two things, how are uh, capital gains and how are dividends going to affect your taxes? Well, it's gonna be a little bit different. But before I move on to that, if you're liking this video so far, please make sure you like it and give it a thumbs up. It really does help me out and I really do appreciate that. Well, we're talking about stuff like this all the time on this channel. Uh, investing, tax optimization, you name it, and especially financial independence. Uh, so make sure you like the video, I'd really appreciate that. Now let's move on to the effect of taxes that these two uh, types of investments have. Okay, and then for you know the argument's sake here, 
we're going to be assuming that you're invested in a ta regular taxable account because uh, if you are invested in a retirement account, uh, usually that uh, anything that you make, any kind of gains, whether they be dividends or capital gains, are going to be shielded from taxes anyway. So if it's within an IRA or 401k or something like that, it doesn't really matter either way. Uh, you know what really matters is total return. Uh, but we're, when we're in a taxable investment account, a regular investment account, uh, it's going to be a lot more important because you're going to be taxed on gains that you consistently make within that account. And basically speaking, you can have two different kinds of each of them. Uh, when it comes to taxes. So for capital gains, uh, you can pretty much have uh, either long-term capital gains or short-term capital gains. And the difference between those is only one year. So a short-term capital gain is going to be anything that you realize under one year. Whereas a long-term capital gain is gonna be anything that you realize over one year. And when you're focused on financial independence and retiring early, uh, you're probably mostly gonna be focused on those long-term gains. Uh, and then when it comes to dividends, pretty similar thing here. We have qualified or ordinary dividends, or a lot of people call them unqualified dividends. So a qualified dividend, it does have to meet some very specific requirements, but then it gets taxed pretty much as a long-term capital gain, like in the same kind of tax bracket there. And these are a lot more advantageous. And so uh, mostly when you are actually gonna be achieving financial independence, the way that you're gonna be investing is mostly gonna get you to quali uh, qualified dividends anyway. And so uh, for the argument's sake of the qualified and the long-term capital gain versus the unqualified or the ordinary and the short-term capital gain, they kind of are very, very similar and they can both be treated uh, in a similar way way just depending on how you're investing you know if you're day trading uh, then you're probably going to be paying the short-term capital gains and the unqualified dividends whereas if you're investing for the very very long term especially over one year you know and and beyond uh, then you're pretty much going to be getting those uh, most of the time you're gonna be getting those long-term capital gains and you're gonna be getting those qualified dividends now where this comes into play is how they are taxed within your taxable account okay so no matter if it's a qualified dividend or an ordinary dividend uh, you're going to be taxed on 100 percent of that dividend you know as an income source so you can be either be 100 percent of that dividend that's paid to you is either going to be taxed at the favorable favorable rate the uh, qualified rate or at the ordinary rate which is your ordinary income taxes Whereas if you're realizing a capital gain, uh, only the portion that is the actual gain is what you're gonna be taxed on. So if you paid $100 for something uh, and then you sold it for $110, uh, the $10 is the gain. So you're gonna pay uh, $10 uh, you're going to pay the tax, I'm sorry, on that $10. That's going to be the taxable portion because that is the gain. Now, if you're going to, uh, that could either be long-term or short-term. So, you know, obviously the long-term is going to be a lot better, but even in the short-term, you're only paying on the $10. Whereas if you were to receive a dividend, 100% of it is taxable either way. And that's extremely important uh, because when it comes to controlling your tax, uh, you know, how much you're going to be paying in taxes, uh, when you are getting dividends, you cannot control when you receive those dividends. Uh, if you own, you know, that share, like a share of the mutual fund and that mutual fund or those companies pay out dividends, uh, you're going to be paying taxes on those dividends. Sometimes at the qualified rate, uh, sometimes not, just, you know, depending on when you bought it. Uh, and all the other factors. Uh, so you have no really control over when you receive those dividends, whereas you have pretty much 100% control on when you're going to realize those capital gains. And that is very, very important if you are you know, investing in a taxable uh, investment account. And to go even further on that point, uh, if you're talking about capital gains, uh, you have what's known as your basis. So your basis is uh, what you actually paid for the you know, original share of the original price. And you can actually, in a lot of your brokers, you can determine which basis you're gonna sell. You, know, you can say, I wanna sell uh, the ones with the longest basis, uh, the ones that I bought first, the shares that I bought first. I wanna share the ones that I bought last, so they have the, uh, the, uh, the shorter gain, like a smaller amount of gains. Or you could say, I want to, uh, have an average of all the shares that I bought, like the average uh, basis kind of thing. And so you are able to control a lot more when it comes to your taxes if you're invested in a regular taxable account uh, when it comes to capital gains, whereas you have no control over the dividends. And that's why when it comes to taxes, uh, in my opinion, I believe that capital gains are superior to dividends uh, in that regard. Now, it doesn't mean that uh, capital gains uh, or seeking capital gains is superior uh, of an investment strategy, uh, Sometimes it is, sometimes it is not. It really just depends on how you're investing, when you're investing, and what your investment goals are, of course, uh, because the real, the real thing that really matters uh, in, you know, above all else, I should say, is the total return. What's gonna get you the biggest return? Uh, that is the overall goal. 
And also that total return has to fit within your risk tolerance. And so maybe the total return that dividend fund investing offers you, uh, maybe it is uh, better for your situation. Uh, you know, if you have a lower risk tolerance and you like the predictability of the dividends, or maybe on the other hand, you want a total return that is larger that you can get from capital gains, uh, you know, especially long-term capital gains. So either strategy can definitely work, but when we're talking about taxes, capital gains are gonna be superior to dividends when it comes to realizing taxes. And while taxes are definitely a really very important part of financial independence, it's not the only thing that you need to know. There is so much more that you need to learn about financial independence and how to achieve it. And that's why I created a really great resource for you that you can click right here to watch called How to Achieve Financial Independence in 10 Years or Less. It's a complete guide to achieving financial independence and financial freedom. Thank you so much for watching this video. My name is Zach from OnCashflow.com and I hope to see you next time.